Well, now let's turn to uh, what I think is also a critical, important part of our show, and that's the My Bill. The opportunity for the people on the show to show what they've built uh, and to talk to us about it a little bit. So, again, the host of this part is Chris Kortz. And, Chris, I will turn it over to you, sir. Uh, thanks, Jim. Oops, slideshow here. Maybe. Hey, Chris, Chris, now I got your contact for in scale windows. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they were there all along. <laughs> Come on. All right, there we go. All right, tonight's uh, My Build uh, is featuring you, of course. And I stopped, or I started at the end. So let me back this all the way up. And we'll try this again. Okay. Tonight's October 19th, I hope. Um, so again, My Build featuring you. And uh, those are some of the uh, fantastic models that we've had uh, on the show over the uh, last couple of years that we've been doing this. Um, I'll just love uh, Bob Farquhar's little uh, caboose down there. That thing just, uh, when I went to redo the slideshow, the thing just captured my eye. It was like, oh, that is so neat. All right. Anyway, we'll move on. Uh, that's me, of course. And then we'll move on to Martin. How you doing tonight, Mar Martin? Okay. Taking me by surprise, right? Making me jump first. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I, I realized that, uh, okay. I realized when I was going through the slideshow that I didn't have anybody have everybody alphabetical. So I re-alphabetized everybody. Oh, I got to change my name <laughs> <sighs> or the spelling of it at least. Yeah. All right. Okay. So it looks like we've got three slides for you tonight. Three. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, so. Oh, gosh. <clears throat> yeah, old-time tank car that I built. That's a scratch-built. Well, the, 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 the flat car underneath it is scratch-built. The tank is actually older than I am. That's a leftover from an old uh, low-bow kit. That was, the, that was the part that was salvaged from the kit. The rest of it was trash. And rather than just throw the, a nice tank away, I uh, put it to work. And uh, got these decals, and uh, finding this color was a little problematic, but we finally tracked down a, a can of paint and got it done. Uh, it's mounted to the flat car fairly simply. Those straps are actually what secure the tank to the car through the uh, bolster down in the bottom of the car. And it, usual, it has the uh, in, uh, pretty close to an intact K brake system underneath of it. All right. That's about all there is to that one. Oh yeah. Now this was this is something a little more fun. This is a uh, a brass uh, IMP tank car from the fifties. Uh, cheap Japanese import from the fifties. It was it was the top of the line item though back then. Um, I picked this up at a train show. Gosh, Harrisburg O scale meet. Um, this spring, this past spring, <clears throat> couldn't turn it down for the price. Uh, it had no details on it whatsoever. So all the details, you know, uh, all it was was the tank. It had the ladder and the uh, stanchions and the railing around it, but everything else was missing, including all the underbody that was completely absent. There were no stirrup steps, no grab irons. Uh, the uh, Placards were all missing. So this was a uh, little bit of exercise in uh, how to use my small torch carefully and put this all together and solder it all up. And so this was all soldered together. The All, all the brake parts were uh, actually one of those rare times where I actually used all brass parts. And uh, this is a really nice, you know, for the, the O-scale people, uh, I'll let it slip out that the, uh, this K brake casting is a nice, it's a back shop product from uh, Wiseman products. And this is a really nice casting because it has the actual connecting for the air train line plumbing in the casting. So it's, you can bend it down there. There is a uh, union joint you can pass. And I did pass the uh, 30, 31 thousandths brass tubing uh, wire I used for the train line through the casting. 
So it actually all connects. It's all, so, all, so it's actually plumbed properly through the, from one end to the other. So this was a, you know, fun car to build, you know, a really complicated paint, paint, paint scheme, black. Ah, uh, gosh, try to stay simple, uh, but nice K4, uh, yeah, K4 uh, decals. So, which worked beautifully. They're really kind of fun to use because he's got some interesting stuff. Yeah, you'd never think that that car was that old. Can you, exactly. imagine, can you imagine that's what model railroading was in the 1950s? It was, it's a beautiful car. It's, it's you know, you know, for 30 bucks, you, you get a nice car that you can uh, you know, put some parts and time into and you got a really nice car at the end of the day. It's actually surprisingly good. I have a second one sitting in the, in the queue waiting for me to do the exact same uh, follow through on all the parts. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> slightly different. It's a slightly different car in that the, the center sill is a uh, different type of brass, different uh, style of brass. So uh, I'll have to see how I solder that up together. Something to burn my fingers on sometime soon. <laughs> what do we? Oh, so yeah, this is a, uh, early slides on this project. I got this false front from Frenchman Creek. Uh, it's a laser cut fr front. So all you get was, all you get from that is the actual front. Uh, those dark pieces of wood that are in there uh, didn't come with it. That's some, actually, that's actually some cherry, uh, some uh, 16,000, 16, one sixteenth cherry that I had. So I, I actually built up a, uh, front and the wall the side walls are all mine the uh the dividing wall interior the interior is all uh paneled uh there's a chair rail that runs around that's all been added the uh storage rack is all scratch built the wall wall with all the framing the back wall has framing as well it's exposed which you can't see in this photo but uh this is going to be a long-term project it's it's a it's a fairly large structure i i kind of avoid large structures because they tend to take over way too much of my workshop because not only are they large, but they sort of call for an interior, a lot of details. And then you have two, two square feet of details spread out, sorted out, cleaned up, all the white metal castings or otherwise, and you have to paint them all. It's tedious, it takes time. And I'll be back next month with an update slide. Oh, cool! So of where we where I've gotten, you know, we'll, we'll do this stepwise. The um, you know, this is another exercise of getting rid of a lot of extra stuff in my shop. I mean, I have I have detail parts in drawers that were well suited to marriage to this uh, project. So I'll get rid of everything in one fell swoop, and I, this will probably end up. Next year, sometime getting auctioned off at the Strasbourg Go Scale Show. Um, I gave them one of my structures for this year's show. I gave them my uh, Yarmouth models, that X31F uh, mm -hmm. PRR car that I had somebody else build and finish for it. But we auctioned all this stuff off at that show and raised $1,200 for the uh, fire department. So we have a really good, we got a really good OSCO show there. I'll plug the show, but I also plug the fact that we try to support our venue because without a venue, you don't have a show. So you got to, you know, work hand in hand with people. It's, you got to make, you know, try, try to be helpful in every direction. And I'll yeah. stop there and let the uh, next victim step up. <laughs> All right. Before we head on, are there uh, any questions for, for Martin uh, regarding uh, either of the cars or the uh, false front? Uh, Martin? <laughs> Whose kit yeah. was that? Are those walls sloped to the back? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's actually, you can't, it's, it's chopped off a little bit. It starts out flat, flat about here, about here, and then it slopes back after about I don't know, 12 square feet. Okay. I got to measure it to be sure. I don't know. Thanks, Mark. Next, next, next month, you'll get a better picture, maybe. Yeah. <laughs>
Who's and the, other, Who's uh, the, the, the Who's false the false front is a uh, is from Frenchman Creek or uh, Frenchman's Creek. Okay. Yeah, I actually bought some stuff. I bought a bunch of stuff from them, and they threw that in here. Have this for fun. Hmm. And I said, okay, I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do with it. And it sat on the shelf for nine months. And I thought, oh, I, I should do something with this before I lose it or break it. So off we go onto a, onto a, a project adventure that's it's going to take, take probably another nine months. Cool. Yeah, it's a great start. All right. Okay. Any more questions? Okay, whoops, now we'll move on to Ed Katie. I saw you online a little while ago. You up, Ed? No, I'm not here. Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> all right, looks like you've got three slides tonight. Yes. Yeah, these are the slides of that uh, I couldn't get to Craig last month. Uh, but basically, it's um, what I did with the... Uh, 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 the non-covered uh, non-covered Queen Post Bridge. I did the same thing with uh, uh, the covered bridge, and that is actually uh, it's gauged out. Actually, the track is gauged to six foot, uh, and uh, the locomotive that you see here is actually sitting on the guardrails, which are actually standard gauge. Uh, <laughs> And uh, so basically right now I'm sort of like experimenting with the broad gauge. And uh, the easiest part right now is actually the track. So uh, one thing I found out with uh, this is a hunter, hunter line bridge uh, that uh, with uh, their narrow gauge bridge is actually a is actually a standard gauge bridge. But because of the NMRA standards, it winds up being a narrow gauge bridge. So that's why I decided to make uh, these two uh, broad gauge uh, uh, broad gauge bridges, and also uh, the the locomotive that's in it, which is a uh, uh, I guess it's called the 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 Dixie uh, Mantua Tyco. Uh, engine, which is actually, from my understanding, double O gauge, not the uh, HO scale. Because uh, if you put a ruler on it, it's actually uh, 11 foot wide, not, not your normal 10. So that's what I'm going to be using as a basis for the uh, probably the first uh, broad gauge locomotive. Uh, because uh, it's about the right size. I just got to turn around and uh, sort of shorten it a little bit to uh, 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 to make it a little bit more proper scale because the, because if you put an HO scale figure next to the cab and all that, it's obviously too large. So I got to take the cab off and make it shorter and possibly the same thing with the uh, with the tender, making it a little bit sh uh, shorter also. But uh, yeah, the, what's the other pictures you All right, have? the next slide. Yeah, this is sort of like shows you uh, what the what the bridge looks with and without the top. Uh, again, you can see the guardrails, which are, those are actually gauged to uh, Gauge to standard gauge. Uh, the six foot gauge actually is about a millimeter sh smaller than S gauge. So anyone who knows S gauge will can sort of figure out exactly how wide the tracks are. Uh, as you can see, I made the uh, I made the roof removable uh, because I am planning on. If I do get into a place that ha where I can actually put a layout on there, I can turn around and uh, I got I got these uh, both well actually all the bridges I got from Hunterline I got them so they can turn around and be removed from the dioramas, so I can you know reuse them. Uh, 
so they're not really permanently on the diorama. Uh, the interesting thing is with uh, what I use for a base on this one, uh, I work at a place that does uh, that makes mattresses. And I wound up actually grabbing um, the thing is we get we get in fabric with in bolts. And uh, actually what I wound up taking is the, the, the usually the bolts usually have this uh, it's a pressed cardboard recycled cardboard thing that keeps the bolts so they don't roll around on the pallet. And that's what I did is I actually took uh, took one, cut it all up uh, because uh, the trough, you know, makes a nice little place where you can have a uh, uh, a little stream bed and all that. So that's what I wound up doing with this. Uh, also, the uh, the abutments were made with. Uh, Piece of scrap wood and uh, uh, bamboo dowels or bamboo sticks that you can, you know, use use for uh, uh, shish kebabs and stuff like that, uh, which is probably better seen on the the first ones. Uh, yeah, let's go back here for a second. Yeah, yeah, you can you can sort of see them down there a little bit. Yep. Yep, and. Uh, uh, there is uh, the the quote stream and all that is uh, uh, like on the like on the the one that I showed last uh, last yeah showed last meeting or your last show uh, the pebbles are actually uh, from uh, an aquarium or you can you can buy a bag of a uh, bag of aquarium stuff and all that. And uh, that's what I wound up doing. Uh, uh, the reason why I went with the specific color is because a lot of the rocks around where I live are a lighter color. I mean, uh, if you took a picture of the streams and all that, you thought that uh, something went wrong. Something went wrong with the color film. And no, that's how they are originally. Uh, there's some... Uh, uh, some marble veins around here. So that's why the, uh, a lot of the rocks around here are more whiter, yellowish color. So that's why I went that direction. And as you can see, uh, the, the, uh, the mixes that I used for the, the bridge are in the background, uh, which I actually, I think I wound up using for the ties and all that. But uh, all right, let's go on to the third one here. Yep, another shot. Yep, there's a shot of the how it looks like with a with a locomotive in it. And yep. uh, and that's all, right. all I can think of at this time. Does anyone have any questions? All right. Well, thanks, Ed, and uh, we we'll, uh, we look to see we look forward to seeing what you come up with uh, for next month. Yep. And uh, uh, Martin has to get somebody uh, with a uh, with the last name of, that starts with A, so he doesn't have to start. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Next up, we have uh, Phil Edholm. I'm sitting right. here doing all this. I have to un didn't have to unmute. So I'm going to jump through the first part real quickly, Chris. Go ahead and jump through. This is. All right. So. I rearranged it a little bit uh, to what I thought was a more logical sequence, but anyway. Okay, that's cool. So basically, these were the Berkshire Valley ore cars in ON30. Um, these are the four. I did, decided to do four because one ore car always seemed to me to be a little lightweight um so there are four you just jump to the next picture i'm not gonna spend a lot of time on these there's a couple of pictures well so the one thing i did that was fundamentally different than martin um i actually pre-painted everything um so everything was pre-painted and primed separately and then assembled um the other thing that was really interesting with this kit was there was when you read the instructions there was a comment in the paint finishing of using some primer to do some etching detail um, because the, the three, the laser cut, um, laser cut side pieces, the grain runs horizontal 
And obviously this, the pieces are vertical, so you get the wrong grain. Um, when I did the, some of the 3D printed framing, I ended up using this automotive filler primer. Um, if you give something three coats of that, four coats of that, you build up enough surface texture that it's pretty easy to put some wood grain into it. So in the next couple of pictures, we can, we can see that wood grain um, in the picture. So go ahead and jump to the next one. All right. So you can kind of see here the wood grain. Um, probably should have done a little bit better. I, I got a little bit impatient on that. Um, so go ahead and jump to the next one. It just yeah, jumped the through. I actually thought it looked uh, pretty decent on that one. Yeah, I, I think it came out pretty reasonable. Um, one thing also thing that I also did was on the ladders. Um, I, I got some NBWs uh, out of the box and added a little block behind the ladders to give them some spacing off of the side. Um, one of the things I really kind of like is it's the thing that a lot of models are more two dimensional on a wall. And this gives some three dimensionality. Um, so go ahead and jump to the next one. Yep. Um, and the interior, et cetera, kind of see the sides. These are just, you can just jump through real quickly on them. That's All right. probably, and then kind of a final shot of the four of them. So that was kind of the first, the first item. This is actually on a, a barge on a module. This is a Frenchman river, their, their barge that you assemble. It's a resin barge. Um, so that was that was that, Chris. Like that's probably enough time on that one. Yeah. Um, who was the uh, manufacturer on that? Uh, this is the, this was Berkshire Valley, and and I thought it was it was very well done. The one the one thing that I came away with that was very interesting is it would be really easy to three D print the body of the car. You know, the fr wood framing and that um, instead of laser cutting it. Yeah, that's what uh, I saw when when I saw the uh, or that's what I was thinking when I saw the the primer coat. Yeah, exactly. It's very much the same. So I was actually kind of thinking that you could you wouldn't want to do that for the the sheets, the interior sheets, a lot of the other pieces, but for the basic framing, you could three D print that if you wanted to. Um, cool. So that was one project. Oh, the final part of this project was. Um, one of the things I did was I used um, the um, Bachman ON30 um, arch bar trucks. Um, they seem pretty fine for it. Um, and this is a method of basically finishing the trucks in volume. I um, mean, you can see this best on the bottom right picture. What we do is cut a four millimeter wide piece of, um, of masking tape and you wrap it around each wheel, keeping it about a half a millimeter on the inside towards the back side of the wheel with about a half a millimeter tape on that side and the majority on the other side. And then you can actually crimp it around the wheel and use your thumbnail to move it off of the edge of the wheel. So the net net is when you paint it, you're actually painting everything but the tread. Um, so basically these were all done that way. On the left, what you see is I just put them on with wood screws onto a block, a block of wood and did the base coat of black. And then they've been rusted with some, uh, Dr. Ben's rust there on the right and then covered with dull coat. Um, so it's a pretty quick way. And actually you probably didn't notice, but all the pictures of the cars, all the wheels are still wrapped with uh, masking tape because I didn't get to be either lettering or weathering. Um, I didn't want to weather until I lettered and I just ran out of time to get the lettering on them. I want to put a number on them and a couple other things and then actually do some weathering. What this allows you to do is it'll actually allows you to take the whole car and weather it as a piece, including the trucks, and then at the very end, you pull the masking tape off and you've got clean wheels to run on. Um, so that was based, I think it's the, the, that's probably the last one out of that set, I think. Yeah, it is. It's, a, it's the last slide that we have. Um, I do have the, uh, the video. Uh, I'm not sure, quite sure do, how this do you, have, do, you have the, do you have the slides from the other, the other set, sec? Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, I thought that, uh, sorry, I thought that those were, uh, this was basically version two of that. Oh no. Um, well, let me do this. Let me just, let me just run the video and I can talk about it and, um, okay. And do I'll it go that, ahead and stop sharing it that so way. Yeah, it. cool. Let me just do this. I'll just, um, actually you go back one, one, one piece here and, um, Uh, that wasn't what I thought it was. So hang on.
All right, I got a little video here to play, so and then I'll talk about it. I'm sorry about that. Okay, so I, I'll start talking about it so you guys can just see this. This is actually a mock-up. Um, I had some slides that kind of talked about it. Um, this came up as a discussion on one of the, uh, on my ON30 group. Um, someone had a comment about saying we should have a, a way to do a um, front panel vertical turnout control. Um, so this is actually a 3D printed turnout control. Um, front panel there's actually the slider for it and this little video just shows the operation um the slides had a bit more detail but we can always watch those at some other point so this will give you an idea of what it is so the idea is you you can move it back and forth here um just as a, a point here and let me back it up just a little bit um this front this front piece here that has the slider in it the two pieces that say normal and diverge are actually separate pieces um, so I have versions of those for put, putting them on either side, or you can change the designation on them. Um, so basically, you just, you just move it back and forth there. And what it does is it basically moves the turnout back and forth. And it's a very solid hold on the turnout. Um, to make, the, to make the, uh, the whole thing work, give it a second here. So this is the underside. Um, on the left, you've basically got the, the armature that goes back and forth that's, hor that's basically a rotational motion that gets extended to a horizontal motion and then gets extended to the, uh, the turnout control. The turnout control actually uses, um, uses four springs and they're off-centered so that you get hold on either side. The, the, if you look at that right now with it thrown to the left like that, the left set of springs is pulling it to the left. The right set of springs, because they're almost center line, has very little um, force that resolves to the right. So it actually turns out this thing pops back and forth. The uh, little switch there is actually a single pull double throw switch. I have another version of this that you can put two, two switches on so you can have one for frog power and one for you know other other signaling mechanisms. Um, the whole cost of this is the 3D print, which is about a 12 hours to print it on an Ender 3. Um, the springs are about 40 cents and the switch is about 60 cents. So it's about a buck of commercial parts. The connector between the two pieces is actually a, um, a coat hanger that's bent and actually those are 3D printed um, pieces to control it. So basically it just, you know, as you move it, it just moves back and forth. You can either you can put this virtually any distance as long as you've got a straight path for the connection. Um, if you want to run it farther distance or an angle, it actually could be used with some of the airline tubing. So that's basically it. Oh, yeah. it's pretty cool. That's uh, I saw the video and I was like, wow, this is a uh, this is pretty interesting stuff. Yep. So it's, I'm trying to figure out. I've got it done, and it kind of it was it was one of those things that. Um, Unfortunately, when you retire, you lose doing projects where you get to intellectually go through the process of solving a bunch of problems. And this actually became a substitute for that. So now that it's done, got to figure out what I'm going to do with it. I'm just going to put it up on Thingiverse and do a kind of a video about how to put it together and use it or do something else with it. But thought it was pretty cool. So anyway, back to you, Chris. All, All right. right. I, guess, I guess, are there any questions? Uh, yes, I have one. Uh instead of having the the fascia going up and down can you also do it sideways or is it not Abs designed? absolutely it, it you know and, and actually what's interesting is i i think it may require some change in the length of that that arm on the on the paddle as i think about it um you could use it with a blue point or with the um, fast tracks um little turnout controls you know the actual turnout motor or whatever you want to call it um, or you could, so you could use the fascia with that, or you could just use the turnout part in another way with just like a pull, pull, push, pull, um, pin like you do with blue point. Um, so yeah, it's, it can be done in a number of different ways if you want to.
Now, what happens if it, the the switch is closer to the fascia? Is there is there like a uh, minimum distance you have to be away from the fascia? Yeah, right now the minimum distance is probably about three or four inches. Um, you know, you could the closer it gets, it's probably problematic. If you turn it over, it probably could be resolved yeah. to be closer. Okay. Any more questions for Phil? All right, well, thanks, Phil. And we will move on. Uh, how did it do that? All right, we'll move on. I think Fran wanted, uh, uh, had a question to ask. Oh, I'm sorry. I uh, know, I, I can pass. I, I was just gonna say, you've been always doing out and back with a second, second pivot. Machine, whether that towards the center of the uh, whether away from the edge of the layout. Yeah, it, that, it, it, right back into the one that's real first. Yeah, what Fran's yeah. saying is actually you could go out and have a pivot point and come back. So one of the things that I was looking at, if you had a place where you had to go a distance over to it, you could actually make a very simple pivot point that would change the direction, and that would be fairly easy to do. Okay. Anyone else have comments yeah. or questions? Phil, do you want to start selling those? No. Um, quite frankly, um, being in the business is probably um, more work than I want to get into at this point in my life. How about if somebody else wanted to sell them? Yeah, that, if someone else is interested, that's something absolutely can do. Like I said, I probably would end up just putting it on Thingiverse and then making a couple of videos or something about how to use it. We could do something. You know, if you wanted, we could actually do something on the show about how you kind of use it and put it together. It's, pretty, it's actually pretty simple to do. There's, only, there's 11 I'd, parts to it. I'd like to do it on the show. I'd like to see you put one together. And the reason for it, it looks awfully complicated to me. <laughs> it's complicated design but it's simple in operation it, but but putting it together would be the problem for me particularly let's say i've got to do 20 on my layout my yep. god i'm looking at a whole winter work to put them together uh, you can you, it turns out putting together the turnout mechanism that side um actually takes about a minute and a half two minutes gotcha it's well, really, it, 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 want, it, yeah, yeah. I'll, want, I'll, yeah, I'll come on and do it at some point. Thank you. Excuse me, Chris. No, it's all right. Any other questions, comments, concerns with uh, Phil's uh, Phil's uh, switch machine or his or cars? All right, we'll move on to Bob Farquhar. You up there, Bob? Yes, yeah, sir, Reby. All right, and we will move on. I think you just have the one slide tonight. Go. Yeah, the front and back. This is a HO scale kit bash. So Barham Mills has the uh, contest going right now. You have to use parts of their kits to uh, kit bash into something else. So I want to do the gas station. So I took the the middle section of the front wall is part of the Clark's Wood products. Uh, the two extensions on the left and right side, they're part of the uh, O'Doul's flop house. And the back wall and is part of Pickham's, uh, Pinkham's uh, palette and something else, something else. Anyway, so the sign in the middle there on the front wall for the pricing of the uh, car repairs, like ping, 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 it's 35 bucks, and ping, pong, ping, it was 50 bucks, and clunk, ping, whatever. <laughs> anyway, it's add a little bit of humor to it all. So, yeah. I sent it into Bar Mills for the contest. I don't know. I haven't heard about that one yet. <laughs> so right. Best of luck, Bob. That's cute. Yeah. Looks very nice. By, right. by, by, by the way, Bob is the show comedian. So if you check <laughs> into the show early before seven, 
Bob, Bob always has a joke for us. <laughs> so, Bob, I, I only have one one question. When you put when you put the lights on the door lights, was there a reason for the one on on the main building, the one on the left, and the one on the right being at different heights? No, not. Not particularly paying attention. The the door on the left is a little bit higher. They're taller, it should right. say. And uh, so it did, you know, different, different type of uh, door. And I thought, bring this light up higher. Cool. These lights are made from uh, shirt, shirt prints, uh, prints, pins, like for the, uh, you know, get to make them good shirts, whatever you get these uh, pins on there. They, some of them are in red and, and some are silver. These are silver. I just uh, use the pin and uh, just bend them. That the end of the pin is the actual bulb. Okay. All right. Any more questions for Bob? All right. Thanks very much, Bob. And now we'll move on to uh, Jeff Jordan. You up, Jeff? I'm here. Hi, guys. All right. Looks like you've got uh, two slides tonight. Yep. All right. There's the first one. Okay. This is, uh, I may have shown this building before. The mining supplies is a um, long out of production resin kit, which came with a rather uninspiring paper insert to provide an interior through that rather um, large set of windows. And I was really unimpressed with it. And so I finished the kit and I put the shades down low so you could see that there wasn't anything going on inside. But then I ended up with um, uh, up at um, Al Judy's show in September in Harrisburg and uh, found this terrific Western scale models interior kit with all the furniture. And so I built an interior, again, using styrene sheet for the floor, the wall, and the ceiling, and installed all of that furniture. And I have some more pictures of that furniture. But before we flip to that slide, let me explain the photo on the left, which is, what's the big deal with two windows? Well, actually, that's a before and after picture. I have an assignment for a local museum where I am actually building a O-scale um, model of a, a local structure that once existed, and I'm trying to make it as accurate reproduction of the original building from period photographs as I can. I couldn't find a window casting like the windows in the building. And I was about to scratch build them when I was scrounging through my window supplies and said, gee, I've never seen this done before, but I wonder if I can just alter a window casting to uh, make the window I need. And sure enough, so on the left is how it came from the manufacturer. And on the right is what it looked like when I was done with a little bit of uh, careful work with a razor saw and some X-Acto blades. And I was able to uh, preserve the muttons and, and just trim down the sides in such a way that I, I you know, changed an eight pane window to a four pane window, uh, trimmed the trim, and then did it two more times. So I now have the three windows I need, but I had never seen anybody describe altering commercial castings, uh, especially altering commercial window castings. And I found it really wasn't that hard to do. If you were patient, you could cut it down. And I'm really happy with the result. Uh, in a couple of months, I'll probably show you the whole building, but it's still in bits and pieces on my workbench. Uh, so. Now back to the, the building supplies um, uh, or mining supplies building. I guess your next slide is going to be a bit more of a close-up of some of the interior there. There we go. And this this just really nice castings. I had a ball putting them together. And you can see there is a roll-top desk. There is a chair. There's a coat rack. There's a safe. Um and on the other side of the room, it uh, was harder to photograph. There's also some cabinets and so forth. And then I illuminated the whole thing with the new uh, Woodland Scenics uh, LED system, which I really, really like. And though once I finished up, I really like the interior, it really brought the inside of this building a feature. You could also see on the other side, there's a clock on the wall. There's uh, some books on the top of the shelf. I, I added the blotter 
on the desk, just a little bit of paper. Now I got to go back in there because I think it needs more paper and stack some papers on the desk, put some catalogs on the shelves and so forth. Also, if you look, I'm really happy on the left there, you see the safe. And I recall that those old metal safes were often very ornate with gold leaf trim and so on and so forth. And sure enough, you can see I managed to add a little trim to it. And it's not nearly as neat as it looks in the photograph. It's just a paintbrush and, and a little bit of gold paint, but it sure looks like it's got that ornate leaf effect and, and the name of the safe across the front there above the lock. Uh, very, very neat little kit and turned turned an empty building. Uh, it re really brought it to life. All right. Awesome. Awesome job. Who was the original manufacturer on, on that building? I was afraid you were going to ask me that. Um, <laughs> It's it, it, it is, is a tremendously long out of production kit. I'd have to look it up. I got it through an outfit that sells estates and collections. And, and it actually was a started kit when I got it. And so I had to deal with the previous uh, owner's uh, false start. Uh, but, but I was very, very happy with that front. And, 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 but I, 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 I did look up the manufacturer. The manufacturer still exists, but they haven't built this kit in very many years. Yeah, it's, is that styrene? No, it's all resin. Oh, it's well, resin. actually, the no, no, no. I'm sorry. the The window fronts are plastic, assembled from numerous separate pieces, glued together. The walls, the trim, the sidewalk, uh, and the roof are all resin. Jeff, let me ask you a question. Uh, how would you feel about uh, uh, doing one of the bits and uh, one of the uh, quick tips showing how to take those mullins out of there to convert the eight uh, pane to four pane? Sure. Um, uh, it, it really isn't that much to it. You just got a lot of patience and a fine razor saw and an exacto blade. And 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 it it trims right down. The the castings are made out of surprisingly soft plastic, so they're very easy to cut apart. Well, I tell you, if you don't mind showing it, because it's one thing to, to say that to people, but for modelers that have never done it before, uh, seeing you at least do one, I think would really be helpful. Okay, I just got to I'll scrounge through my uh, parts box and pick out a window casting that I can um, cut down. And then I'll do some photographs of it if, you know, if you, step if, by step. That's great. And and uh, uh, let me know when you're ready and I'll, I'll notify Hank Primus and, and he'll uh, uh, include you in the quick tips part. So it won't take you long to do it, but it'll at least show the people really what, you know, how careful you really have to be, I guess, is what I'm trying to get to here. Yeah. And, and, and that is true because the tolerances are very tiny. Uh, the cuts are very fine. The, uh, and, and I found a sequence to do it that uh, enabled me to preserve the muttons. Uh, yeah. I actually left them a little long on the top and the bottom. You know, I trimmed the top and the bottom sills off, took material out of the sides, and then put the top and the bottom back on. And that enabled me or, or you know, dry fitted them, gave me the, the spot to trim the buttons, because I was only going to get one shot at it. And if that didn't work, I would have to replace them. And that's the that's the kind of detail that I'm looking for in the quick tip, because the modeler, uh, in other words, that kind of that kind of detailed information about how you went about it to make sure that you the one shot you got work. That's what they that's what modelers need to understand. OK. And, and, and I think the key thing is, is, is the sequence. I thought yes. uh, I came up with is, is what made it work. Absolutely. And, that, and that's the detail about how to do these things that, that, you know, just saying, you know, be careful and you can cut it up, but how you went about doing that, that process, I think is important. Okay. Yeah, I, I can do that. I'll, I'll just scrounge another window that I can modify and, 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 and photograph the work in sequence. Yeah, just let me know when you're ready and, and we'll get you on the show, okay? Will do. Thank you. Thank you. All right, any more questions for uh, Jeff?
All right. Uh, we'll now move on to uh, Jer Gary Shergold. You up there, uh, Gary? I'm here. All right. Looks like you've got two slides tonight. Hmm. Yeah. Um, Chris, this is a uh, Jordan uh, miniatures kit, uh, HO scale. And um, I uh, looked at this kit and then I put it away. <laughs> and I looked at it a couple more times and put it away. <laughs> Finally, I started to build it. The, the biggest challenge on this kit was the horses. They come in two parts. Uh, there's eight of them. And you glue them together. E each horse is different. Uh, you glue them together. And then you have to do a little bit of carving to uh, blend everything in. Um, it was three stages on the coloring. Uh, the uh, wagon itself was uh, fairly easy to uh, put together. Uh, everything was uh, painted up. And then what I, I came to, the, the kit uh, for the harnesses on the horses uh, that the driver is holding, the kit comes with uh, wire to do those harnesses. Well, the, the wire doesn't give you the droop that you need between each horse. So I used uh, uh, shipbuilding thread hmm. to uh, run the uh, harnesses, the uh, straps that control each horse. Um, as I say, uh, all the decals, uh, there was like 10 little decals. Each one of those little squares above the wheels uh, is a different city in the United States oh, wow. that the uh, Budweiser beer was manufactured. And cutting those out was a little bit of a task too. And they have to be placed in their proper spot. But overall, the kit was uh, very nice to uh, put together. The other slides will show you a close-up uh, yeah, these are the horses, uh, mm. a little more closer shot of the wagon. It, uh, it took about three weeks of different evenings working on it. Uh, the uh, only mistake I made on it was the beer kegs themselves or the cases. It should be light tan not dark brown. But Gary, it was a what's fun... the... oh, sorry. What's the difference in ship's thread and just regular thread? Why, why did you specifically use ship's thread? It, it's finer and uh, it has a, uh, a nice little texture to it. Uh. I've had a roll of it. Uh, I've probably had it for at least 30 years. Hmm. So it, uh, it, the, the thread looks much nicer than the wire because it, the thread droops where the mm -hmm. wire doesn't. Yeah. But the and kit what, was fun. What, what's the material for like the, uh, the harness to the double tree? I'm sorry? Okay. Uh, what's the, the material that you have that connects the, the horse's harness, that ring around his neck, to the double tree? To the Okay, that, that is a, uh, a little tree harness. It comes with the kit. Uh -huh. All the uh, uh, straps or the straps that hook up to the, uh, I, I, like I call them T-bars, that uh, connect all the horses in line those white things between the horses. Yeah, uh, the double, black that's uh, little arms, they uh, come with a kit and they're snapped on or glued on. And uh, then the harness around the, ne the uh, horse's neck which stick up. It, it's sort of like a little ornament thing. It has a little gold emblem on the top 
and uh, yeah, just really a little, nice. little if, you, if you go on the internet and look up the Budweiser wagon, you, you'll see the horses. Uh, now the one, I, I, I did a little research and some of them had actually chains on the two lead horses would have chains connecting uh, the uh, draw bars and that, but uh, on, on some of them didn't. So on mine, I didn't put them on. Are the horses uh, white metal? No, everything is uh, plastic. Looks good. Yeah, when you put the horses together, as I said, uh, you need to do a little bit of carving um, as they, they, they come in two halves and you glue them together and then you've got to carve and blend them in so that the bodies, uh, the two halves match and shape into each other. These are Clydesdale horses. Uh, so they've got an awful lot of fur and that uh, or hair on the bottom of the legs and on the sides going up. Gosh, you can almost hear the dogs barking and the horses clomping. <laughs> it was a fun kit. Yeah. All right. Any uh, more questions for Gary? Great job. All righty. Well, thank you, Gary. And now thank you. we'll move on to Bill Stimson. All right, Chris. Yep. All right. Looks I'm like here. we've got two slides for you tonight. Sounds good. All right. All right. This is the start of my little boom town that I'm going to build. There's three buildings in it. Uh, the one on the left in that upper left picture is a Mud Creek kit. Uh, I think it was Brotman Hobbies. It's, I just bought it because it was an easy one to build real quick and turned out to be very nice. I haven't decided what it's going to be in this uh, boom town. The built two buildings in the middle are from a Tom York um, sketch in uh, for Holy Flats. I think this is the bordello and the pool hall that uh, I've scratch built here. And it, it, I'm still working on them. The one on the right is uh, patterned after one Dave Meek did for his gruesome uh, casket uh, portable layout that he's been featuring on a bunch of videos lately. And that's uh, MT Graves uh, Undertakers. And you can see the size of these things with that penny there in the middle. <laughs> What's the next? Huh? What scale are your buildings? N scale. N scale. What did you make them of? What's the material? Uh, the Undertaker is um, styrene, mm. and so is the uh, Bordello in the pool hall. The Brotman kit is uh, laser cut wood. I'll be darned. Nice model. Thank you. you yeah, I them? actually uh, had dinner with the uh, with Fred and uh, Natalie from Mud Creek the other night. Uh, good, good people. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, um, the, um, the people from uh, well, uh, Jeff Adam was there, and so was um, oh crap. Uh, the uh, folks from uh, crap. I wish I could remember the name offhand. From uh, I'll come, it'll come to me later. Sorry, <laughs> just having a brain fart at the moment. Anyway, um, so yeah, it looks uh, very nice there, Bill. Um, Why don't you show the other one, Chris? Oh yeah, that would help, wouldn't it? All right. Yeah, now, the other thing I'm experimenting with on empty graves is the light on the outside. That's a, a Woodland Scenics N scale goose lamp. And I actually put, I bought a kit with two of them and I put the second one inside just to show off. I'll probably put a regular LED in there, but I just thought that would be interesting to see, at least see what they do for us. So that's my first experiment in actually lighting an N-scale building. 
what is the what is that an LED in there now? Yeah, it's the second. There's a second gooseneck clamp inside. I just laid it down inside to take the picture. Oh. So it's an interesting model. If you ever get a chance to look at Dave's videos, they're they're fun to watch. He models an ON30, I think. Yeah. All right, little memory jogger. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, Ron and Michelle Clace of Mind Mount Models. That was a that was who else we had dinner with the other night. Good people. All right. Anyway, um, back to the subject at hand here. Uh, looks uh, very nice there, Bill. Does anybody have any questions for, for Bill on these, these uh, three buildings? All right. I guess not. So uh, thanks, Bill, and everyone that shared. Uh, the next My Build is November 23rd. And, of course, it's featuring you. Uh, email me at uh, railrunner130 at hotmail.com to participate. Um, and if you have not shared anything before, number one, it is highly encouraged. Um, and uh, number two, make sure that uh, you send us a photo of yourself to include uh, for your uh, introductory uh, photo or your introductory slide. All right, so with that, uh, looks like we've had another successful my build. So I will turn it back to you, um, Jim. <laughs>